Could I just add two points to your question? Um, first of all, I appreciate, I like agree. <laughs> um, and I think it's a really good point. Um, but just continuing to put on this newsletter hat, I think something I'm observing is newsletters are increasingly mimicking some of that personalization that you like in podcasts. Like if you observe who sends the newsletter over time, maybe you notice it starts to be the person. You know, that there's an actual name and there's a profile photo and it's signed and it's in first person versus second or third. Um, so I think that there's some, like, some antennas that are going off in response to that. Um, and then the second thing, to your point, um, is I, I wonder how much of it has to do with the fact that um, we, the model used to be a lot for news gathering was a reporter going out into the field, and now that is more about having a two-way conversation, oftentimes digitally. And so figuring out how to, qualify, like how to package that it would be a really interesting thing to consider. Anyway, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, can you say your name and the organization that you're with, please? Oh, my name is John Huang. I'm with uh, an agency called Lanyu. Um, can you give a little bit of context why newsletter is such a better engaging, engagement uh, platform? I, I, maybe I missed it, but like newsletter is just being described as, oh, that's... It's not a holy grail. No, but I mean, like, could you could you explain to unpack it for somebody who's like yeah. not sure why newsletters all of a sudden being talked as almost equated as like a, a great engagement platform? So, could you explain that for us? Sure. Uh, so, newsletters are useful because um, I think they speak to one of the points that that first question was in that you can curate the news that you're interested in more specifically. So, rather than like a news alert, even where you're going to get all the breaking news alerts. Um, if you're interested in one particular aspect of a certain subject that a news organization provides, you can get that specific newsletter. Um, so I think it addresses a handful of different points that we're all interested in right now, which are things that are like niche and they're also succinct. I think we're looking for things that are easy as consumers that we can like um, quickly access, access. And then on top of it, it's like a one-time sign up. So you do it once and then you're in. Uh, so I think. It's, it, and it's also interesting, one thing I've seen is that some newsletters have, have built their own communities. You know, the, I went to the panel this morning about community building and how we think about that, but there's one called uh, Girls' Night In, I think, um, that I was following, where it, it's turned into a book club and they have meetups and they, you know, and it's all generated from a newsletter where uh, women decided that they would share resources about what to do when you decide to stay in on your Friday night. Does that answer your question? Um, I'm missing a little bit of the history before of the context of how it emerged and like, is, is this a common practice I, I would, I, or is this a... Well, well, also when you look at the means of engaging with somebody, you have your website, social, email, and events. Right, mm -hmm. that kind of like it invents being in real life, right? So would we look at it in those four ways? I, I, I think also this might just be missing too, I, and I'm, the numbers aren't super fresh for me, but I think it's just that it's worked too, yeah. like that newsletters have been sort of a bright spot yeah. in engagement where a lot of other metrics have kind of been looking shakier and shakier. Uh, email newsletters have been surprisingly resilient. Um, so people are subscribed to them. The open rates are pretty good. Um, they're good real estate for ads. Um, advertisers look out on them more favorably than display ads. Um, I, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. So there's, there's also, I'm going to take this moment to, Shorenstein Center has a tool that Jackie Boltick developed. Correct. That I actually used one night. I am not, I'm tech savvy, but I know just enough to be dangerous. And I actually set up Anaconda and ran this right. thing, which was bizarre. But it's amazing what happens when you can follow directions. And it shows you your basically subscriber rate, like your volume and how many people open. So like frequency, it's like a little heat map. So it really tells you who your loyal audience is and who your sometime audience is and how involved your audience is if they subscribed over the past month. And it's, it's the website, it's the um, 
newsletter data that like MailChimp does not give you just by looking at your deliverability and your open um, and clicks and things like that. So I highly recommend if you wanna completely geek out for a moment to, to examine that. And then you'll get a sense over time of really how, what your audience seriously looks like. And it was, it was pretty eye-opening. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something, newsletters are something that are typically, I mean, there are some that are premium that you pay for, but then oftentimes they're free. And the idea is, you know, if you're expanding out the funnel of people who are consuming your news, then if you, if you keep them on, you hook them and they're loyal, they might then end up subscribing and being members of your organization. And then from the nonprofit world, and Harry, I don't know if this bears out for City Bureau too, is the folks that are most likely to donate to Injustice Watch are folks who get our email newsletters. So that's... Yeah. And, I, and I should clarify that I've mainly been working with nonprofit news organizations when I'm looking at newsletters. And anybody else? Hi, um, I'm an editor for a digital travel site. And we talked a little bit at the beginning about how traditional click ads and banner ads are dying out. Those obviously aren't engaging the audience. I'm wondering like what you guys have found is taking their place or creative kind of nuances, um, the front runner and kind of what's replacing that for the digital editorial space. One thing that's been fun to see is uh, how like, I see, I see this a lot in newsletters where there can be product recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be something, you know, that used to be if you were in a magazine, it would be like, you know, the top 10 gear for your bike or something. That, that's something I see now um, is that sort of thing. Or sponsorships or affiliated links, you know, things where you can like give a shout out to some, you know, a partner organization, something I see. Yeah, I, I would agree. Before I worked at City Bureau, I, one of my roles was to sell ads for a small local publication. Um, and I think we're, we're glossing a lot when we talk about the kind of decline of the ad economy. And I think especially for hyper-local publications, for niche publications, there is a pretty robust ad economy in that, I mean, at the very least, it's much stronger than the kind of big picture aggregate numbers. Um, so. That's one piece. Um, I also think there's, there is sort of a shift to sponsorship, like that same publication that I worked with is starting to repackage some of its marketing options into something that looks more like sponsorship because they're realizing they tend to do business with a particular kind of local business and it is actually more than just purchasing space. They also sometimes turn down ads that aren't gonna be, that aren't gonna be interesting or helpful to readers. Um, and so thinking about, uh, instead of just display ads as purchasing space, ways that that can be a, presented as a relationship that has a lot of different touch points and um, is not an endorsement, but is a statement from the advertiser about their interest in the reader through the, the lens of the publication. Uh, I think there's uh, a lot of potential there too. My name is Kat Friedrich. I run two news projects at Yale. I wanted to respond to what you said about newsletters and also what you were saying about automation. We were experimenting with a bot earlier, and what we found is that actually, despite the sort of hype around bots and that people are really into them in some ways, we found that actually adding newsletter features, plus using Qualtrics, which you know has a lot of features within it, actually would work better for what we were talking about than using a bot. So this is just an example of us experimenting cool. where we found that newsletters plus Qualtrics work better. What was the actual experiment? What were you? Oh, this has to do with some dialogue that we're doing to broaden the dialogue around energy efficiency and solar power to rural parts of America. That sounds so cool. What did the bot do? Sorry, just because I have a lot of thoughts about how newsletters could be better, and maybe yeah. I'm wrong, but if you've tried something. Well, essentially, the bot was going to engage in dialogue with readers, so that what we would do is we would use the newsletter to direct the reader to the bot, and then the reader would have some dialogue there about specifically the state where they live. 
And so we were, you know, determining the questions, et cetera, and experimenting. And what we found is that Qualtrics actually is something that we'd been using before and actually worked better and was more versatile in terms of getting the information that we're looking for and also going back and forth. Okay. Yeah, and just to clarify, I love newsletters. I just keep thinking, like, we have a really interesting one at the Inquirer um, that goes out every morning. It's called, like, the Morning Edition. And there's, like, 24 stories in it, right? And, like, my product brain just wants to be able to be, like, I wanted that one. I didn't want that one. I wanted yeah. this one. And just, like, shrink it up yep. to the, like, 10 essential stories that I would want. Yeah, 24 and is a lot. I was just yeah. going to say, I stop at 8. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally like fair. Um, but, uh, but I just, I think that there are... Um, like some really interesting like additional product features that could kind of take newsletters um, even you know make them even more successful yeah. so yeah absolutely yeah. yeah there's good and bad yeah sure are there other questions because so one that I had while well, you're all thinking about your next questions one that I had was resources because mm -hmm. when we're talking about like I hear focus groups and people gave us feedback about like their button and I I'm like oh wow that would be so awesome if we had the time or money to afford that kind of interaction. I know like when you yeah. have an experimental group, but then also, then you're talking evaluations and it's like, did you get professional consultants to come in and say, these are the questions you wanna ask because that's what you were talking about too when you had your mm. consultant about, this is your project, this is what you wanna think about, this is what you wanna, mm -hmm. you know, you, and you need three people to figure out how to measure it. And then how do you know you're asking the right questions? Do you need outside help with that as well? Because it's hard to wear a lot of hats. Yeah. And if you want to take a hat off, it's going to cost mm -hmm. money. Well, one thing that has been really, this is, a, this is like a tangential side answer. This is not an excellent answer. But uh, it's been neat to see how like, cross-pollination and collaboration mm -hmm. Like the, you know, just talking about the work that City Bureau has been doing in different places, or INN, you know, um, or even like the way Lundfest has been doing really neat things. I know um, it seems like that's a way to maybe uh, deal with that lack of bandwidth to some mm -hmm. extent is is partnering and and um, kind of divide and conquer that way, or get feedback. I, I don't know, I, but I just think that's like a neat thing to see what could happen if we were able to do more things like this where people come out and share ideas openly and willingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, qualitative research, I think, can be less expensive than it can appear. Okay. Um, the way that we launched our surveys was through Google Forms, which is free and available mm -hmm. to everybody. Um, and, and to be honest, uh, the folks who helped us understand that initial kind of like bar of success, useful and interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we're kind of researchers within our parent organization, so those people kind of like should exist, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. um, in, in some organization having, you know, research or um, user experience folks. So you can kind of lean on them and ask yep. them to yep. kind of collaborate and cross-pollinate. Sometimes they're not getting asked those types of questions by folks. Um, and um, in terms of the analytics team that we hired here at Digital, again, those disciplines typically do exist inside an organization, yeah. right? There is somebody who's implementing analytics and... Depending um, on how big the organization is. Yeah. Yeah. It's just um, uh, carving out that time to like yeah. have a little bit of fun and yeah. like think, think about what you might want to measure yeah. um, and whether or not people within your organization's um, metrics kind of complement or like work against one another. Mm -hmm. Like an example I can think of as a product manager from USA Today was we would look at, um, you know, the traffic, the number of push notifications that we were sending um, would drive traffic up for editorial, right? So they would send a bunch of breaking news alerts and then kind of you get your consistent kind of uh, set of pages. But if we sent too many alerts, we couldn't really prove this because metrics are hard sometimes. People were deleting the app or turning mm -hmm. notifications off because of that frequency, right? Yep. Um, so that was an instance where your metrics were actually like at odds. Um, and there was never kind of this holistic view of like which metrics are we all working towards and how can we build products and create content that are like complementary in that respect. Um, so I guess when I work in small labs, we can control that ourselves. Um, but when you kind of go into a bigger organization, it's really difficult to get people to talk about, um, you know, a, a collective set of metrics that are meaningful. This, I think City Bureau is coming from a slightly different place because we're a, a startup. We have a very 
small team and I think a, a strong case that, that a lot of people care about uh, in what we're trying to do. But we've asked for help like constantly along the way. And I, we have a really big network at this point and a lot of those connections have started because we asked for help. Um, and I think we found that those uh, were really good foundations for relationships that uh, we've built on. And um, so I think especially for smaller outlets or for community media, I would not underestimate the willingness of the public to step up and make a contribution. I think people feel in some cases a lot better about that than just say giving money. Uh, and it can be hard to coordinate. It can be hard to organize. I think we, we've got to be real about uh, when it makes sense to do, but that's been a huge asset for us. Uh, we've also collaborated a lot, but not in the sense of just kind of a free for all. Like we've, I think, been very intentional about the kinds of collaborations that we've done and tried to understand like what we're providing and what we can do uniquely well that fits into somebody else's strategy and also why, what they will bring for us and why they're a great person to play that role. And it doesn't make sense for us to um, go out and recreate the wheel. Yeah, exactly. So basically don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. Count on your network. Yeah, and also I think be very, know your organization well and collaborate intentionally mm -hmm. uh, rather than kind of, I don't think we collaborate just for collaboration's sake. Yeah. We want to uh, use that as a way to, we build relationships by doing real good work yeah. together. Anybody else, questions? So, Carrie, you were talking about, um, you mentioned previously the experiments that are run by Shorenstein Center and LendFast. How do news organizations um, get involved? How do, how do we find academic or philanthropic partners to help get, break through some of these questions or barriers? Uh, so I think I would love to hear what both of you think about this as well, because um, I think you have um, perspectives on this. But off the bat, I think you know, kind of staying in the conversation by subscribing to a handful of uh, news outlets that are covering this, I think that's one way you kind of keep in the know about uh, when there are grant applications, like uh, Newsmatch is an example yep. of a great one. Um, but I think it's also just helpful to show up um, like, I'm sure being in an event like this, you're just engaging other organizations you didn't know about and it puts you on that radar and it just kind of tumbles onward. Um, but I imagine you both have thoughts about that too. I mean, I'm quite new at Lundfest. And Lundfest, <laughs> um, you know, as an organization is relatively new, but, um, you know, we do lots of traditional things, right? So kind of get a Twitter account and be constantly posting about links to, to um, open source grants or kind of grant mm -hmm. grant calls. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, to be honest, that was kind of a challenge for us at The Guardian. We were doing a lot of good work in a tiny office in the financial district, right? And oftentimes um, your outlet is to post things, you know, we would post things on Medium. because so it was a really easy publication to kind of spin up and get out there. Um, but we did lots of other things. We would, you know, do Hack Hackers workshops and, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to be able to go to a lot of conferences and kind of speak about our work. And maybe it's just about not being afraid to come up and talk to folks afterwards and kind of ask them questions. Because um, I found that over time uh, in my career, like it is just an investment of time to find your collaborators and kind of um, find people who also um, are interested in kind of growing their careers and growing their, their experience. Yep. Um, and I find out about a lot of things uh, through our company Slack uh, yep. channel, right? Yep. So. If you've got four or five or six people who are all keeping their eyes out for these things, um, then we kind of share them in there. And uh, I mean, that's like half my day I could just be reading our Slack channel, <laughs> which is like part of the problem. There's too many great things yes, happening. Right. Um, so yeah, I think it's easy. You just have to be looking for it yeah. and find your um, kind of like-minded people. And foundations do fund for-profit organizations as well. It's just not a, it's not a nonprofit party. So. I was hesitating a little bit on this question because if the question is just like how to get plugged in, there are a lot of great newsletters out there. Pretty much every foundation that's taking this problem seriously is putting a lot of thought into it and is writing publicly. They're really interesting. They're really rich resources. Um, but I also think that there is a lot at stake in what's being funded and 
how it's being funded and even just the idea of philanthropy funding journalism when it is this kind of strange hybrid market right now where you have these massive uh, media companies, some of which are outright and explicitly managing decline. Um, so I, I think we should keep that in mind too. And I know people in this room are coming from many different perspectives on that uh, question, but especially for uh, funders or grant makers who are approaching this question, I think we, especially people in community media should be making an adversarial case about some of these funding practices. Uh, because if outlets really are thinking of this in, ma in terms of managing decline and trying to maximize profits irregardless of the experience of the readers or how it's, uh, what the consequences are for a public good, then uh, we, I don't think it sh we should be putting public resources uh, or philanthropic resources into it. Um, and just being able to think about that um, as part of the conversation, I think is really important. Exactly, well, and a lot of that, that's part of the funding as well. It's almost a prerequisite that says, we're gonna do this because you are going to release your findings or you're going to contribute back to the community yeah. in a certain way. Also, one of the, one of the um, programs that I ran at INN, I actually collaborated with Rich Gordon at Northwestern, and we took five INN sites who volunteered to turn over access to their Google Analytics and their MailChimp stuff, and we essentially did an audience, audience development assessment and plan for these five sites. So regardless of where you're at, if you have a journalism school or a maybe a computer science school kind of thing is partnering with them, calling up a professor and say, hey, do you have a bunch of students who want to dig into my analytics and help me figure out the answer the, my, this question? Um, and you'll probably find some takers, I would imagine. So any other questions and stuff? What's our time? We're on. Five, five, ten minutes? Okay. Anybody else? Do you guys have anything to add? Well, I have questions for you. There you go. Uh, I'd be curious to know if any of you are doing experiments that you're interested in sharing. Okay. Do you have any questions around, like, are you doing something that you may be hitting a wall on that you might want some feedback on? Hey, so uh, we've been uh, experimenting with newsletters a lot, and uh, one of the things uh, that we've done is uh, we've made a site for each of the uh, NFL teams, and so on the newsletters page, we also give the user the option to sign up for maybe another team. You know, so uh, kind of the interconnection or interconnecting of um, different sites, you know, uh, it, it's not just linking to it, but maybe, you know, giving people an option to sign up um, on other sites. So, yeah, that's worked pretty well for us. Cool. Is it a sign up box? Uh, yeah. So when you type in your email, there's a little area below. It says, oh, do you want to sign up for anything else? Yeah. Or after you sign up, it's like uh, it will uh, kind of gray out that mm -hmm. checkbox and say, okay, well, if you want to sign up for anything else, just let us know. Um, and, and we're not going to, we, we kind of also uh, group everything together. So we're not going to send you like crazy amounts of email. Uh, so that way you can subscribe to several things and, and uh, you know, you get only a, a, a fair, like not too many emails, you know? So, yeah. uh, uh, separate research has gone to that as well. Uh, so uh, we keep on changing our strategy. Yeah. That's great. Cool. <laughs> this is for the USA Today sports team. Um, so yeah, uh, let me, if you have any questions. Are you tracking at all kind of the, how long people stay on to each newsletter and whether or not it was like the primary newsletter that they signed up for or the secondary? Can I keep an eye on that over time? Uh, yeah, usually people will sign up for a single site, and then uh, it wasn't it wasn't until we were uh, we we had uh, it wasn't until we linked 
people uh, to that newsletter landing page that uh, in, in the nav bar until we started seeing like that multiple sign up. Um, but we've been looking into possibly uh, saying, hey, you're subscribed to this. Maybe you, you can subscribe to something else. Um, we also just launched an app uh, called Sportswire. Um, so essentially, let's say you're, you know, you hear about it from, um, you know, uh, Cowboys Wire, right? And, and you uh, download the app. You also have the option to say, oh, he hey, here's all the other th teams you could be informed on. So uh, that way you only get notifications on, on the teams uh, that you're interested in. Yeah, so we've been expanding to like things like basketball and that and that kind of stuff, or, or specific players, and and uh, yeah, it's been working pretty well. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I used to work at USA Today, and uh, I remember kind of I love the way that you're surfacing options like much more contextually for alerts, right? So uh, a couple of years ago, you could sign up for all these categories for notifications, like life and business and sports and that type of thing, but. Um, and this is not just USA Today, it's most apps, it's kind of buried in a settings section. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas just something as simple as surfacing it on a sports story about that particular team, um, it seems like the right, right place to do it and it's respectful of time and kind of captures people who you know are already interested in something. So um, I think that's a great, a great way to approach it. Yeah, and I, and I think there, there's other interesting things out there like uh, browser notifications, you know. Um, We've been playing with that, and and uh, when you publish an article, you have the option to oh, you can also share this with anybody who has the uh, notifications set up for their Chrome uh, browser, so they actually see it in, on their desktop. Yeah. So um, there's so many like notification things out there that yeah, you wanna. It's almost like uh, you don't want to make it too easy to to notify people, or else you know you get that kind of spam. Uh, like a thing going on, yeah. Do you guys have any, like, um, like the New York Times has kind of their open blog? Um, just because you guys are doing kind of some things on the edge that people could learn from, do you have plans to kind of write about the results from those types of things, or is that part of what you... Uh, yeah, we do, uh, but it's, uh, we don't have an official blog. Uh, I'm not sure. I know we write about it somewhere, but yeah, I need to yeah. look into that, yeah. Well, just to Caroline's point, like, that people are doing such amazing work and you could spend all day just reading about everybody else's work. And I think that that's what sites like betternews.org um, is trying to do, kind of like give you a way into kind of all of these resources, but it's really challenging. Um, mm. So to have one more kind of voice on, on how the results are going um, from that, I think would be really useful for the industry. Yeah, I'll look into that. Thanks. <laughs> betternews.org, I just wrote that down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask a question really quick? I know I am the mic person. Uh, so there are a lot of people in the room here who are either part of an agency or they are developers who are kind of supporting a newsroom in some way. And by the time the work gets to them, especially with an agency, it's either on billable hours or very limited time. And sometimes by the time the project gets to you know the folks in this room, they just have to make a quick decision and just get moving because it doesn't feel like you're delivering results unless you're actively building something. Any advice on how to run experiments to make sure that your final product is as the best it can be on a very limited, very expensive, you know, limited time frame? Sorry, is the question how to do, um, how to learn things quickly and build good products um, without spending a lot of money because newsrooms' budgets are constrained and they only kind of want to pay for things that they can like see immediately. Is that? So I think f I, I'll, I mean there are folks from agencies that can speak to this better than I can. But um, usually by the time an agency is brought into a newsroom, they just have a limited window to execute. Mm -hmm. You know, versus an internal team with like David's team, yeah. he might be given a little bit more leeway to just. Mm -hmm figure stuff out over the course of a couple months. Yeah. You might not be able to do that when you're brought in. Can I ask a question again? How, um, in a situation like that, in the meetings leading up to it, are, are there, um, are there like, like the org meetings that kind of go through exactly how the workflow, so that they understand why they're doing what they're doing? Does that make sense? Any agencies yeah. want to speak up? <laughs> Hi, I'm Libby Barker. I'm a senior project manager at Human Made. Um, we work with a lot of uh, clients like USA Today. Um, oftentimes, unless 
um, we have a pre-existing partnership with um, a client, like we kind of work collaboratively with USA Today a lot, so we have an understanding of um, what, if we're brought on to do a project, um, the backstory, the context of a project, but when a decision is made prior to us being brought in, we're brought in to complete something, um, those conversations are not always clear. Um, so I think what Steph is asking is, how, as agencies, do we better uh, coordinate in those types of situations when a decision has been made and an agency may be brought in because an internal team doesn't have the bandwidth to uh, deliver in a short time frame? So how do uh, we get from that decision all the context kind of uh, mind melded yeah. into the agency? Does that clarify? Yeah. Okay. Do any of you want to take this? I, I have good experience on both sides, and I'm currently working with an agency who's like our web dev team, and I, from where you're sitting, I don't know that there are many options once you've been given a baked idea and given this much time to execute because they have to go to market. The, your real opportunity for change and impact is the next conversation of, hi, we are doing this right now, and we will do our best. You, we, we are more valuable to you and you will get more bang for your buck from us if we're involved early on, right? Because that's what you're seeking. And then you need to address, now I, I'm your partner. Now I'm thinking if I, if I start talking to you at the beginning, is that when the clock starts ticking and that's when you start charging me so that by the time we're in, into development, that I'm already five, 10, 20 billable hours into the project. Mm -hmm. So that's, it, that's a pain point for them that you would need to address. Um, but I'm, I'm with you as being a, <laughs> on this side of your, the client side is that I'm, I seek agencies who are interested in being partners, but I wanna know what I can do for myself. Like tell me what I can do for myself and how I can get the highest value from you. That's the other thing as well. So like our web, the web team that I'm working with, they're like, if you know how to put in a WordPress plugin, go ahead, you go to this point and then call us in and we'll hook up Google Analytics to figure out how to do X, Y, and Z. So having that sort of conversation to allay their fears about incurring too many costs. Does anybody want to, did that answer your question? Did that get to? Yes, it kind of generated more questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just that you're, you're limited. Once you get it, it, I mean, you can't, otherwise you're asking 18,000 questions that get into what was the thought process here? What's your goal? What's your... Right, right. I completely understand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, okay. Yes. No, that's fine. Does anybody I, else have a... I was just going to extend it a little bit that we, I think at Savior we've learned a huge amount about project management from looking at how developers do their work. Uh, and part of that was having um, developers on our board early and thinking about some of the tools that we needed. Uh, so I just think there, there is a really interesting overlap and I think it is possible. I know that's not, that's not helpful. We're just putting more work on your plate, but I think a lot of that should be, a, if the conditions are at a really productive conversations, I think journalists and media organizations can and should learn a lot from how uh, software developers work. I get just one really, really quick thing, I guess, um, it's just that uh, those are really tense situations, right, of course, and I think that um, like a little bit of honesty and like transparency helps, because um, what I immediately came to mind is having like a very well-defined like statement of work, right? Um, at the beginning and those are the people who are negotiating this deal kind of need to be very clear about what you can deliver in a certain time frame So that is an important step um, But maybe something that I would try would be just being very human and saying listen Here's like the ten things that we would have liked to have known before starting this project, but we don't have time to do them So here's what we know and here's what we can deliver and maybe next time we can work on so it's very similar to what Sherry was saying mm -hmm. maybe next time we can kind of start a little bit in advance because people sometimes don't understand how transformative like user research can be until they've had a chance to go through it right um, 
So, yeah, and I'd love to talk about that a little bit more offline and share like another anecdote from, from my team, but yeah. I, I just thought of something that might be helpful too that we've learned at City Bureau, so we're not just extracting from mm -hmm. uh, developers. Uh, we've got, we go hard on templates when, because we have to partner with a lot of people. We have, they're not exactly clients, but we have a different guest speaker for every single public newsroom. So every single week there's a new stakeholder and very different work styles, different organizations. We have like checklists that people have to check off and things that they sign. And uh, we really try to walk people through that. And if I, I think that could be really, it saved us a ton of work. Um, it saved us a lot of staff time. If just being able to hand somebody a template for like, please check these boxes before we sign a statement of work. Um, yeah, that's really central to our practice now. Hey, there's a quick question. Uh, which organizations do you look to for inspiration? So examples of media organizations that are doing really cool work, uh, they're doing really cool work with experiments or anything like that? It's a fun question, mm -hmm. right? That's a great one. Everybody. <laughs> I think um, one organization that is maybe worth watching a little bit more closely is the Wall Street Journal. It's kind of an untraditional answer, but um, we, we collaborated a lot with them kind of at the, at the Guardian and um, they were really open to, they did exactly, they got plugged in, right? They were kind of going to all of these events and um, they have a lot of editorial leadership that has moved over kind of into the product side. Uh, and we ran some experiments with them um, around their kind of live business blogs um, where we, you know, it's kind of this inline notification thing because you guys have probably all seen a live blog and it's going on for hours or days and you kind of pop in in the middle and then as you read, updates come in, but there's just like a little bar and it says there's like eight updates, but you don't know what those updates are. So is it worth like going up to see the top or do you want to stay where you are, et cetera, whatever. Um, but so they saw that they wanted to improve their, their live coverage and they saw that we were doing a lot of research in that area and kind of found us and ran an experiment and put kind of a live survey into their live blog um, saying like, how's this going for you? Like, do you like this experimental feature? And you had business reporters who had worked for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years at the Wall Street Journal getting so excited logging into the Google form and seeing like pie charts changing from like red to blue to green. So like one thing I would very, I would advocate for is kind of like giving journalists or like people on your team access to live feedback from real people. Um, and it turned into them actually building something into their tool that said like, did you like this story? Yes or no? Or something. They put it, it's, it's replicable now and you can put it on any piece of content at the journal. Um, so, so I kind of, I, I appreciated their approach because that's not kind of how, um, how a lot of news organizations tend to approach their product development. So I'll think of other kind of smaller and scrappier things while everyone else talks, but I do love the journal. I think they have, um, a lot of good projects and a good mindset. I, I think City Bureau, we could take that question in a lot of different directions. Um, we look a lot at other media organizations and in particular the history of it and have tried to be sort of students of the history of journalism to understand what's happening. Uh, so pay a lot of attention to kind of industry practices. There are, our peers are sort of hard to identify, but I think there is kind of an emerging um, group of organizations. I'm really interested in what the Bristol Cable's doing. Uh, in Bristol, England, they're a cooperatively run uh, publication. They do a lot of kind of partner reporting where they'll have, I think they call them syndicating reporters, but they'll partner a journalist with somebody who's interested in telling a story and have them work together. Uh, and I think there's, it's, they're really cool experiments and I'm, we're following closely. Um, there's a, a outlier media in Detroit is a text message based ser news service for low income folks in Detroit, especially focused on property uh, ownership, which is a big deal in the housing market in Detroit. Uh, the East Lansing Info is a hyper local kind of experimental approach. I could list more and I'm sure I'm leaving off some cool ones. Um, we've also been really in, uh, inspired by some youth media organizations, youth radio, there's a couple in Chicago, Yolo Kali especially, um, because I think that sense of people producing media that is both valuable to them and benefits them and also uh, has a, uh, an impact on the community, that's something that really started in youth media that we're just sort of taking into a more traditional journalism space. Uh, and then after that, if we really wanted to blow it up, we are also really interested in borrowing practices from like totally different uh, fields and industries. So I think our public newsroom in its 
uh, sensibility has more in common with like an open mic or a church service than it does with a lot of the um, events that journalism organizations are often putting on. Uh, community organizing, we've borrowed a lot of practices. We regularly have public newsrooms with community organizers about uh, their practices. We do asset mapping, for example. Um, public institutions, public libraries, we have a really good partnership with the Chicago Public Library, uh, especially in certain neighborhoods. That's sort of the one really robust civic space um, that's out there. And especially when there's a good branch manager, those are really powerful sites. Um, so I think there's a lot of places where news and information is exchanged that we just typically don't really think of as being news or media, but that we could learn a lot from. So I have a suggestion of a newsletter for you, uh, which is Ground Source. I think it's Ground Sourced or Source, but they, uh, the person there uh, profiles each week, I think, um, an organization that's doing something interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's something I would consider following to see some innovative practices. Um, for me, I've, I really enjoy watching uh, one of my local news organizations that I follow is KPCC, which is a radio, uh, radio outlet in LA. And uh, they've recently purchased the LAist yes. and um, have been doing some really cool things. Like I was listening last week and they asked for people to like call in, they were, they were totally merging the formats and asking people to call in about experiences they had and then they were gonna publish the stories in LA. So it's a yep. neat little hybrid thing. Um, they also started working with Harkin too, correct? And, they, and Harkin yep. um, is another one. And then um, I would say, I mean, this is just so fun, I could keep going. <laughs> um, we have to wrap it up. Okay. I just have two more quick ones too. If anyone interested in uh, civil, I'm kind of civil that yeah, one. so um, the Zigzag podcast really kind of like breaks it down. It's like two women who are kind of participating in civil, um, but have been documenting their own process of working with civil and kind of the pros and cons, and it's really accessible, which not all the stuff out there about civil is right now. And um, I forgot to plug a solution set. So that is the newsletter that um, Yossi Lichterman, my brilliant uh, colleague, puts out every week about one innovative thing that's happening in local news. So uh, that's also a great one. And I would lastly say that I'm interested to see what happens with Chicagoist. Mm. Yes. OK. <laughs> Chance to wrap. And then also follow Shorenstein Center, City Bureau, and LenFest. So oh, yeah. thank so you very so much to our thank panelists. You yeah, thank you all very much. <laughs>